Hi, I'm David Himmelfarb, Managing Partner of Himmelfarb Przansky Personal Injury Lawyers. And today's topic is uh, non-traditional compensation sources. Um, we usually think of uh, compensation for auto accidents where we have a tort claim and accident and benefits and you know the person that struck you in the accident. But what happens in situations where you're struck by someone who doesn't have insurance or who leaves the scene of the accident? And in this little known area, um, just because someone might leave the scene of the accident, that doesn't leave you out, of, out in the cold in terms of being compensated. Um, there are unidentified and uninsured motorist provisions in your own insurance policy. So, uh, if you are driving and you have your own insurance and someone strikes you and they don't have insurance or they're unidentified, they leave the scene of the accident, never to be found again or identified, you have coverage uh, for that. So uh, the standard automobile policy covers each individual up to $200,000. And so uh, that is found <coughs> in the Insurance Act under Section 265 which mandates that every insurance policy must have this type of coverage. And what we've done is we've identified uh, for you uh, the Insurance Act and the specific Section 265 that identifies that. Now, how are you covered? Coverage is available for anyone who is an occupant of the insured vehicle that is struck by an unidentified or an uninsured vehicle. So and you loan your vehicle out to someone and uh, they get into an accident, well, by the fact that they are an occupant of that vehicle and they're struck by someone who's unidentified, they are covered under your policy. Whoever the insured is, and the named insured, the person who owns the vehicle and gets the insurance on it, they're always covered. They're the insured. Um, the spouse or dependent relative of either the occupant or the insured or a pedestrian that's struck by an unidentified or uninsured automobile. <coughs> um, there is something called a, a 1% rule under Section 265. Uh, if there's anyone else at the, um, uh, involved in the collision that is at least 1% responsible, and I mean someone who has insurance and someone who is identified, if there's someone else who's there, who is at least 1% responsible, then the law says that their insurance company has to pick up the, uh, the balance, the tab, for all of the damages that flow from that accident. And your own insurance company, which is the uninsured or unidentified coverage, would not, would not apply in that certain circumstance. Um, <clears throat> as uh, we told you, um, regardless of the number of claimants, uh, the unidentified limits for damages are $200,000 per accident. So that could be problematic when you have numerous people that are involved with an unidentified vehicle. Uh, for example, an unidentified vehicle strikes a number of pedestrians and then leaves the scene of the accident. That may uh, have problems, especially if they're covered under one policy. Uh, they would have to share in the $200,000. Um, we've given you a case study here as well. The facts are as follows. Uh, you have a client who is struck as a pedestrian by an automobile that is uninsured. The client's 24 years old and in school at the University of Toronto. She lives on her own and she works part-time. The solution here is that the client may have private automobile insurance. So you check her relatives. Are any helping to support her in any way? And if so, would she be an insured under the auto policy and have access to full accident benefits and unidentified coverage in tort for up to $200,000 plus costs? Now, in addition to the unidentified and uninsured coverage that's found in every policy, there's a special endorsement, a special addition that you can purchase uh, through uh, your insurance company, and that's called a family protection endorsement. It's actually called uh, an OPCF44R. That's the technical name for it. Um, but uh, we know it as the Family Protection Endorsement. And the, in the endorsement actually calls itself the Family Protection Endorsement as well. Now, what is this? What is this endorsement? Well, what this endorsement is, 
it, it's, it's an underinsured endorsement. So what it means is <coughs> that you can purchase insurance and add it on to your own uh, coverage so that if anyone hits you and is responsible for your damages and they don't have enough insurance to cover your damages, then you can cover yourself for anything between what that person may have in insurance coverage and what your damages are. Now that's also subject to the amount of insurance you purchase. So if a person um, only has $200,000 of insurance coverage and you have a million dollar family protection endorsement, then what that means is that your own family protection endorsement will cover you between the $200,000 and the million dollars. There's a case study that uh, we've uh, put forward and the facts are as follows. Clients suffer serious injuries and they're valued at a million dollars as a result of a car accident. The at-fault uh, motorist has uh, liability limits, insurance limits of $200,000. The client does not have her own insurance policy. However, at the time of the accident, she was separated but not legally divorced and her spouse had purchased the family protection endorsement under his own motor vehicle insurance policy with a face value of a million dollars. So we have that situation where there is a policy there of a million dollars under family protection and only two hundred thousand dollars from the at-fault motorist. So in this particular situation, even though she doesn't, the client doesn't have her own insurance, she doesn't have her own insurance available, she is still legally married to her spouse and as a result would have coverage under the family protection endorsement and have the availability of that extra eight hundred thousand dollars to help cover her losses. So quite a substantial, substantial endorsement um, uh, and something that everybody should be aware of. Now <coughs> what happens if there's no insurance at all? And, uh, and you don't have your own insurance policy to cover you for uninsured or unidentified coverage? Or what happens if you don't have um, uh, any coverage whatsoever? In, in, in this sort of circumstance, the Motor Vehicle Accident Claims Fund is uh, set up by the province of Ontario. And basically, it's the payer of last resort. And it effectively takes the position that it, it provides $200,000 of compensation available for uh, every party, uh, for third party liability. And it also provides full accident benefits, which provide income replacement, medical and rehabilitation uh, expenses, attendant care, um, home modification, and housekeeping. Uh, those uh, could be significant because if you're catastrophically injured, you could be entitled to a million dollars of uh, medical rehabilitation expenses as well as a million dollars of attendant care expenses. Uh, so in these situations, even though um, there may not appear to be any insurance whatsoever to cover this situation, the person is entitled to full accident benefits and up to $200,000 of uh, liability insurance available. So a uh, fact study here, uh, a client is a minor who's a passenger in a stolen motor vehicle driven without the owner's consent and involved in a serious motor vehicle accident. Well, uh, the client's not entitled to uninsured motorist uh, provision um, or uh, any other type of insurance. So the solution is to apply to the Motor Vehicle Accident Claims Fund for payment of statutory accident benefits and tort damages. There's another example of, of uh, uh, how this would work. Uh, you have someone who doesn't have their own car, um, who is a pedestrian, uh, who's walking down the street, who is struck by a vehicle that then fleds, uh, flees the scene of the accident. And in that situation, no one ever um, uh, is able to catch up to the, to the person that struck uh, the pedestrian. And in that situation, there's no insurance to cover that situation. So they would go to the Motor Vehicle Accident Claims Fund for full accident benefits and up to $200,000 of tort um, uh, uh, money available. Uh, there is also uh, for workplace accidents, the Workplace Safety Insurance Board um, is, uh, is an area 
that, uh, that uh, the board takes over jurisdiction of anyone's ability to sue an employer for negligence. Um, and in, since about the 1920s in Ontario, we've had a, a no-fault regime in terms of workplace injury. So it matters not whether your uh, employer is at fault. Um, you can be at fault for an accident well, that's caused at work. And as long as that is, uh, is correct, then, um, and that's a fact situation, then you're entitled to uh, WSIB benefits. Um, the uh, section that um, identifies the uh, board's, um, uh, 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 the, 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 the section that uh, indicates where the board has to pay you is uh, found in section 13, which indicates a worker who sustains a personal injury as a result of an accident uh, in the course of his employment is entitled to benefits under the insurance plan. <coughs> Um, now, there are certain exemptions and exceptions to this uh, act. Uh, like I told you, it's been around from the 1920s onward. Um, those who are not covered uh, by the definition of worker under the act would retain the right to sue and have access to the courts. And those people would include executive officers of a corporation, independent business operators, sole proprietors and their spouses, partners in a business and their spouses, volunteers, at-home workers, and casual workers. So those people uh, mentioned would not be identified as workers under the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act, and so the act would even apply to them. If they were injured while they were working, they wouldn't have access to the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and indeed they'd have the right to sue. So if there was someone who caused an injury while they were working and they're responsible for it, those people have the right to sue. Also, the Act establishes two categories of industries to which the uh, WSIB applies, the coverage applies, and those are Schedules 1 and 2. The Schedule 1 um, has a number of industries that are broken down. There's nine industry classes, and um, employers from uh, the schedule are to pay premiums on behalf of their workers. And uh, we've set out the, the uh, nine industries, and you'll see what they are, forest, mining, primary industries, manufacturing, transportation and storage, retail, construction, government, and then other services that is uh, uh, essentially uh, a catch-all for the rest. There's another schedule then, which um, is our industries that are self-insured, and they pay the full amount of the claim plus an administration fee that's set by the WSIB. So Schedule 1, uh, they pay premiums, the board pays, the government pays for the uh, claim. Schedule 2, uh, they don't pay the premiums, they simply pay the claim plus an administration fee. Those uh, uh, industries uh, set out in Schedule 2 are provincial and municipal governments, crown corporations, telephone companies, airlines and railways. Now, there are over 100 industries that are omitted from the schedules, from coverage. In order to be uh, covered by the Act, you must have, uh, you must be listed in one of the schedules, um, which means that you must be an industry in Schedule 1 or Schedule 2. And we, have, we know that there are 100 industries that are omitted from coverage. And what does that mean? It means that they don't have coverage. If there's an accident that occurs in one of those industries, the workers retain the right to sue. So they would have access to the courts, access to pain and suffering, all the damages that flow from our court system, and they wouldn't be stuck with the WSIB. Um, and we have some examples of uh, the types of uh, industries um, that would be um, not found in Schedule 1 and 2, part of the 100 uh, that we've identified. For instance, banks, insurance companies, trust companies, credit card companies, and other financial institutions. None of those companies are covered by Schedules 1 and 2. Any accident that occurs at work, if it's the fault of the employer, the employer can be sued. Full tort. Law firms, same thing. Real estate agencies, business associations, recreational and social clubs, live performance theaters, trade unions, private schools, recreational and vacation camps for kids, travel agencies and health clubs. So 
It's important. It's a very complex and convoluted area because the, the, the coverages sort of overlap with each other and they're, they're quite antiquated. But there's so many holes uh, in terms of coverage that allows people to break through and sue. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, Act expressly provides that injured workers cannot sue their own employers. So the general rule for WSIB is if you're covered, if you're a worker in your covered industry, you cannot sue your employer for negligence. However, there are some very important distinctions between the schedules and they are as follows. A Schedule 1 worker who's injured can bring an action, can, can sue, a Schedule 2 employer or a Schedule 2 worker. So you can have a claim from one Schedule to another, Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. And a Schedule 2 worker can bring an action against either a Schedule 1 or a Schedule 2 employer or worker. So it's important when there is an accident to determine, and, and we, see, we see this come up mostly in, in um, motor vehicle accidents where you may have both parties in the motor vehicle accident um, are actually working at the time that the accident happens in, and um, they would have an, an election to either go into the WSIB or if they have the right to sue, for instance in this situation where one may be a Schedule 1 worker and the other a Schedule 2 worker, they may have the right to sue and if they do, then they can elect out of the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board uh, regime and, uh, and actually have the uh, access to the courts. Very important that in these situations people consult lawyers immediately after the accident so that the lawyer can determine whether or not the WSIB applies or whether they have access to the courts. Another uh, non-traditional source of compensation is criminal injuries compensation. And we all know that you know, criminals do not have insurance to cover the crimes that they're committing um, for their victims. And we all know that victims are entitled to be compensated uh, if they're a victim of a crime, so especially a, an assault, sexual assault, all sorts of uh, horrible things that can happen. But, uh, um, and most of the times what will happen is, uh, especially in sex assault cases, um, there's no insurance to cover uh, the uh, perpetrator and uh, even if the person sues them, they're left chasing them for um, a judgment that they may receive and never get fulfilled. So uh, the government uh, of Ontario has uh, stepped up and um, has something called the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. And anyone who is a victim of crime is entitled to make an application to the board for compensation. And uh, it sets out, um, there's an act, it's an act of parliament that sets out uh, injuries com compensable. Uh, it says where any person is injured or killed um, by an act or a mission in Ontario um, occurring as a result of, and then the commission of uh, a crime, uh, then the board may uh, order uh, payments of compensation to the victim, um, etc. And that's sort of the, uh, uh, the statutory framework. Uh, when you look at the framework in a little bit more detail, <coughs> injury means actual bodily harm and includes pregnancy and mental or nervous shock um, and includes, um, includes treatment expenses, travel, loss of income, pain and suffering, funeral, burial expenses, loss of financial support, bereavement counseling, um, and then there's other, if, for example, support of a child born as a result of a sexual assault. Uh, we have a case study here. A client is a volunteer at Carabana. The client suffers a head injury and subsequent stroke after being pushed to the ground by participants. <coughs> the client is not covered under the Carabana's own liability insurance. Criminal injuries compensation would pay that person a lump sum and monthly check for loss of income for the rest of their life. It would, it, it would be uh, payments basically up to 65 for uh, loss of income. Um, also, when people are injured and disabled, uh, it's important to look at whether they have insurance through their employment. 
Uh, people have group benefits. Uh, many employers have group benefits that have medical and dental coverage. They also have uh, disability coverage. Uh, most employers will carry short-term and long-term disability coverage. So it's important that employees are aware of the actual coverages that they have. Uh, in group insurance, uh, short-term disability usually covers the first three to six months of lost income if, uh, if a disability prevents the person from working. Uh, Long-term disability uh, policies usually go uh, up to the age of 65. We see uh, a lot of policies are now um, going up to the age of 70. It's very important that a lawyer look at the policy, the LTD policy, the long-term disability policy, uh, to determine um, what the um, period of time is that the insurance may have to pay for. And usually in long-term disability policies, there's um, uh, two uh, periods. Uh, that the insurance company has to pay. There's the own occupation um, period and then the any occupation period. Um, the own occupation period is usually a two-year period that the insurance company will pay you if you cannot do your own job at the time you became sick. And then after two years, they'll only continue to pay you if you can't do any job for which you're reasonably suited. Uh, you should also be looking at the extended health and dental coverage because um, you will be covered for costs for uh, services and supplies, prescription drugs, medical services, paramedical services, equipment, and they may not be covered elsewhere. You may have plans that cover things like that. And we're thinking of things like therapy, physiotherapy, injections, things, things that may not be covered elsewhere. So very important uh, for us to look at uh, the, those types of uh, insurance uh, plans through employment. <clears throat> There's a case study, uh, um, for example here, client works at Exco at the mall. On her way into the mall from the parking lot, she suffers minor injuries as a result of a slip and fall. Since the client is not in the course of her employment when the accident occurs, she's not entitled to benefits from the WSIB. Uh, but she is entitled to short-term and long-term disability benefits as a part of her company's group benefit insurance, in addition to extended health care benefits and potential tort claim against the property owner and maintenance company as a result of her slip and fall. Um, similar to the group benefits that are available through your uh, work, uh, there's also privately purchased insurance plans. Uh, we generally see these with people who are professionals. Uh, sometimes you see uh, high wage earners who um, are limited by the amount of group insurance available for their companies and they'll end up uh, purchasing extra policies. <coughs> so um, these are generally uh, short-term and long-term disability policies as well as life insurance policies. There are critical illness policies as well as homeowners policies. And um, similar things will apply from the last category, which is the group benefits, in terms of the STD and the LTD uh, policies. But there is a probable life as well there, and uh, critical illness is something that uh, is being sold recently um, and marketed uh, quite aggressively, and we see more and more claims on those types of policies. Case study, uh, the client is a passenger involved in a car accident. The driver of the car is at fault for the accident, but the driver's insurance company alleges that there are coverage issues which reduce the available insurance to 200,000, not enough to satisfy the claims. And the solution through discussions, it's determined that the client had a private insurance rider in her life insurance policy with a further $50,000 available. So it's a very important especially for the lawyers to go through the types of different coverages that the clients may have. <coughs> now, there is also government assistance that is available, uh, and what we've done is we've essentially worked out uh, the three types of government, uh, federal, provincial, and municipal. At the federal level, there is um, employment insurance and CPP disability. Uh, the employment insurance disability is for a period of uh, 15 weeks. Um, uh, and uh, CPP is you must show that there is a severe and prolonged disability uh, and uh, that you're not capable of any gainful work 
uh, and that will kick in really after probably um, a period of time where uh, all the physicians agree that it is, you are not going to get back into the workforce. And once that happens, an application can be made. Uh, provincially, there's ODSP, which is the Ontario Disability Support Plan, which is actually a form of welfare, but provides enhanced benefits for those people who can um, show that they have a disability that's preventing them from work, and they have no other um, uh, ability to bring uh, claims uh, for insurance benefits. And then, of course, uh, where uh, the person isn't disabled from work, there's Ontario Works, which is just stri straight welfare. Um, there's also occupier's liability, and what we've done is we've uh, um, set out a section of the Occupier's Liability Act. So w what is occupier's liability? Well, occupier's liability is uh, basically if, if, if any private landowner, public landowner, um, anyone who owns premises or occupies premises has an obligation to make sure that anyone who um, comes onto those premises can do so in safety. So. Um, you know, we all know that when people go to uh, shopping malls that the uh, owner and operators and occupiers of the shopping mall have a duty to make sure that uh, the uh, shopping mall is free of hazards, slipping hazards, tripping hazards, any hazards. If people can get hurt, you have an obligation to make sure uh, that uh, those have been removed or people have been warned. Um, and, and that's set out um, in the Occupier's Liability Act under Section 3.1, where it says, an occupier owes a duty to take such care in all the circumstances as is reasonable to see that people entering onto the premises and the property are reasonably safe. And so that duty um, is uh, statutorily set out, <coughs> and um, an occupier is identified as someone who's in possession of the property or has care and control of it. Now, uh, anyone who's injured and uh, is bringing a claim under the Act has to show that their injuries were caused by the failure of the occupier to take reasonable care to ensure that the injured parties are reasonably safe while on the property. And that includes a duty to warn, as indicated earlier. For instance, shallow water. If someone comes to your cottage and you know that they're going to be diving off your dock, and you know that your dock has water of maybe a foot and a half uh, at the end of the dock, you have an obligation as the occupier to um, warn the person that there's really shallow water and that they can hurt themselves if they dive in head first. Um, there are exceptions um, for risks willingly assumed, um, you know, uh, people that enter into sporting events, for instance, um, <coughs> are exempted for that. Um, and homeowners insurance will uh, always cover uh, occupiers' liability situations, as well as business insurance if the, uh, if the uh, commercial business insurance, if the uh, incident occurs uh, at, a, at a place of business. There are a case study here. Um, we have a client is visiting a friend's cottage for the first time, decides to go for a swim. No one's around. He dives off the dock without knowing the depth of the water and breaks his neck. And these, this is an actual case that we had. The client successfully sues the cottage owner for failing to warn him that the water at the edge of the dock is deceptively shallow and not safe for diving. You are unable to look into the water in that particular case to see the bottom of the water. It just looked like water and it appeared to be much, much, much deeper, more deep than it was. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and another case study. A client self-employed electrician who's hired to fix electrical problems at Exco. Client suffers severe damages from falling 17 feet from a ladder, which was set up for him at the workplace. It was defective and it wasn't properly secured. Client was not entitled to WSIB benefits as he self-employed and did not opt into the program. Solution here, and this again was another case that we had. Um, the solution is Exco, whose employees set up the defective ladder for the use, is found liable and negligent and paid full damages in that particular case. So, uh, the Himmelfarb Przanski advantage. Uh, we can help you stay on top of all current legislative changes and judicial decisions, 
help fit clients into one of the compensable categories that have been mentioned today, determine all available avenues of coverage in order to maximize recovery for our clients, and ensure that deadlines and limitation periods are met with respect to each application and or claim. I want to thank you very much for uh, listening today um, and um, hopefully uh, non-traditional compensation sources can be useful to you in the future.